right, everyone, let's get started today. Today we are going over the idea of imitation and imitating God is the idea behind the message today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Otherwise, we have the scriptures up here. Have you ever been imitated by someone before, whether for good or for bad? I think kids imitate people all the time, right? You know, when I'm cheering for the Packers or when I'm cheering for the Bucks for the first time in my life this last year, <laughs> and I jump out of the seat and I start, you know, go team, whatever, my kids start to copy that. Or if we're watching E.T. and it's a scary part in the movie and I spook one of them, they now think that that's game to start spooking people during all movies. And so kids like to imitate, right? And that's the big idea behind this passage. Verse 1, we see in Ephesians 5, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So God is telling us he desires us to be imitators of him. You know, we're image bearers of God, right? We are created in the image of God, and we are reflections of him. And now in action... He wants us to live and to be like him. Now, in this all, anytime you start out a chapter in general, it's always good to look at the context, right? So let's look at the verse before and see what he's talking about. When he says, therefore, what is he talking about? So verse 32, chapter 4, it says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. This is the thing, like, God's heart for us is kind, and that's so important. And in any relationship, whether it's with your spouse, or with a coworker, or with a family member, or with another member in church, it's so easy to not want to be kind. I'm, all, I'm this all the time, like, it's so easy if someone does something that I think is weird or dumb, I immediately want to be unkind, or I want to go to a person where I can snicker about them behind their back. But God is saying, regardless of that, regardless of how you feel, the command is, be kind. And this is for all Christians. And also, tender-hearted. I honestly think tender-hearted and being tender-hearted is one of the hardest things for us as Christians to do. Because what's the first thing that we do anytime we get into a disagreement, anytime we have an issue with someone, automatically our hearts get hard. I know for my heart, it's so easy where my heart will just, I start to get angry at people and I don't care about them and then I just, my heart gets hard. And so it's amazing because here is our creator talking to us about our heart condition and saying that how we think and feel in our heart is important, that he desires us as Christians, as little Christ, as imitators of God, to be tender-hearted. I think you see snapshots of this in the scriptures. As you look at Jesus, and he's dealing with mankind, right? And he's dealing with the Pharisees and all their weird religious rules and how they keep on making more of them, and then he's dealing with sinners that are just sleeping around and having a party, and his heart is tender towards them. You see glimpses of it, where the woman was caught at the well, and she was about to be stoned, and while he told them not to stone her, his heart was tender towards her and called her towards repentance. God also tells us in verse 32 to forgive one another. This is important as Christians. We're bound to mess up. We're bound to make mistakes. We are going to cause issues. And in this life, God calls us, God commands us to forgive as God in Christ forgave us. And that's honestly, like Christianity gives us the fuel like none other in this life, a resource to forgive. No matter what we've done in this life, everything that I've ever done in this life has been wiped clean by Jesus' forgiveness. Therefore, I now can treat everyone the exact same way. Doesn't matter what my spouse does to me. Doesn't matter what my coworkers, what my friends and my enemies do to me. I can always forgive because God forgave me. 
And that's how he jumps into verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. I love this because you have this idea of God taking the initiative, right? In forgiveness, God took the initiative. He just didn't just sit back and say, you know, all right, we'll, we'll see how humanity goes and watch nation after nation destroy itself and go down the tube as they all do. God came into existence, into mankind's world that he created and made a way for forgiveness by dying on the cross. And in the same way, in this life, when it comes to forgiveness and being tenderhearted and being kind, we need to take initiative and not wait for others to come to us. That is a Christian concept to not be passive in our forgiveness, in our kindness, but to be active. This idea in verse 1 where it says, As beloved children, and this is something that spoke to me as I was just reading through it, where, you know, honestly, if there's anyone here that just needs to understand that you are beloved by God, I don't care what you've done in your life, I don't care what you've been through, whatever you have gone through in this life, God loves you unconditionally. And that's what God wants us to start off with in this chapter. This idea that we are unconditionally loved by God. Think about, like, how much do you love your kids? It doesn't matter how much your kids mess up. You're still going to always love them. It's the same way with God. When we are part of the family of God by belief, God loves us no matter how much we mess up in this life. And then verse 2 of Ephesians 5 says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. God is calling us to live, to walk a life that is defined by love. There's so many different things that define us. If you're to ask yourself, what defines me? If people were to think about me, what would they think about? What is my biggest thing in life? Is it my possessions, you know, my car, my house, my toys? Is it what I'm always talking about? Is it like there's so many different things in life that can define us, and God yet is calling us to live a life where love defines. Honestly, I've met so many different Christians from so many different churches in my life. And if I'm really honest, there's probably only been a few that I've met that have lived a life where love defines them where I think about that, I'm like, oh man, that person is always serving. doesn't matter if it's a family party, if it's church, if it's whatever. If they're on vacation, they're always serving. They're always loving. And certain people, I think in our life, no matter what they're going through, just shine through. I think of my aunt who had cancer three times and then died after the complications from the third one. She was one of the people that probably suffered most that I've seen in my life. And throughout it all, she was one of the most shining beacons I've ever met of someone who just loved God and loved other people in very real and practical daily ways. And honestly, just touching her life helped shape and mold who I am today and how I view life and how I view God. And that's what God desires us to live like, uh, to live a life where love defines us so that whoever we touch is touched by God's love through our life. And who knows what type of change will happen from there. Verse 2 talks about as Christ loved and gave up his life. You know, the Christian life actually is not like this passive, chill life. It is an active. It is a life that requires sacrifice. Just as marriage requires us to give up time and energy for our spouse, Christianity and being a Christian requires us to sacrifice our life. Jesus gave up time for us. He came down and lived 33 years with humanity and worked and served and ultimately died for us. So you have to ask yourself this question. What are you sacrificing for God today? What are you sacrificing for those whom you love as you walk in a life of love? Verse 15, jumping on, we're going to be kind of skimming through this chapter a little bit today. 
Verse 15 talks about living life in a wise manner. It says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. I think we will all agree that there is a wise way to live life. There's a wise way to run a business, right? If you're, there's definitely like, if you're just reactive and you only react and you're never proactive in a business, whether you're the owner or whether you're just one of the, you know, the worker bees in the business, you can tell when businesses are run wisely and unwisely. We can also tell this in a nation, when a nation is being you know, run wisely or unwisely. And so God is saying, when it comes to your life, how are you living? Are you living wisely or unwisely? Be careful. Look carefully then how you walk, how you live. In the same way a business and a nation can be dealt with unwisely, we can live our life unwisely. And so what is this wisdom that God is talking about? Because there's, honestly, there's so many different areas you can get wisdom in your life, right? There's mentors, there's parents, there's friends. Some of the wisdom is not good that we get from people. Ultimately, I think the best source is God himself through prayer and the scriptures. And so we come through this idea of as we're imitating God, let's imitate him by living a life of love. Imitate him by living a life that's wise and also a life that has submission. I said it. Submission is a, is, a, is a word that's gotten, I think, a bad rap. But honestly, for a decent reason. Because throughout humanity, it's been used incorrectly. There is that negative connotation because men have forced it upon ladies throughout history. The problem is in the scripture, when correctly understood, submission is actually a good thing. It's actually a positive force because submission is a free gift that can only be given freely. And so jumping over to verse 22, many of us know this idea where the scriptures talk about wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. But what is God talking about when he's talking about submission? Because honestly, just the verse before, he says in verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here's a command by God that says all Christians everywhere, men and ladies included, need to submit to each other. The pastor needs to submit to the congregation and the congregation to each other. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. Christ is the head of the church, not me. You know, Christianity can't be forced on anyone. It has to be a free choice. You can't force people to believe in God. You can't force people to go to church. You can't force someone to submit. You can never force your spouse to submit. It's an entirely wrong way of viewing submission. Submission is giving over of your life, your will to another to view them more highly as your, than yourself, not because they're worth more, but because you voluntarily give that up for that person. You see this in Jesus when, you know, the, as the night before Jesus died, when he was, you know, praying in the garden, and he said, not my will, but yours be done, Father. Right? There's this idea that Jesus didn't want to go through that cup that was coming of taking on the weight of the sin of the world upon himself. And I think it gives us a beautiful picture within Christianity. And honestly, Christianity is 2,000 years old, and we have this idea, even back thousands of years ago, that men and women are equal and yet different. You see, within the scripture, we have this amazing theology of the Trinity. Not going to say I understand it perfectly at all. I don't believe anyone does. But we know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all equal, are all one. They're equal in authority, and yet they're different. The Spirit supports. The Son came and lived a life and died and rose again. And the Father loved the world that he sent his Son. They each have different roles 
and they work in perfect unison as one. And in the same way, God desires us as Christians to work as one. He desires our marriages to work as one. We are equal just as Jesus is equal to the Father in worth. And yet our roles are different just as Jesus' role is different than the Father. It's like on a football team. Yes, I like using football analogies. A quarterback's role is different than a lineman or than a running back or a wide receiver. Yet, if you take any of them out, the team will crumble. We are all equals in worth, in marriage and in the church. And yet our roles are different. You see this in different verses in the scripture where it talks about how there's different people in the church and while some may seem more lowly and while the pastors may seem more highly, in God's eyes, it's not that way actually. We are all of equal worth and yet differing in our roles. And God calls us towards submission. And so ask yourself today, as a spouse, how are you submitting? As a Christian, how are you submitting? I think it's important to God. If it wasn't, he wouldn't have put it in the scriptures. It doesn't stop at submission, though. It goes on, I think, to an even stronger command in verse 25 when it talks to the husbands. In verse 25 of Ephesians, chapter 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives. Not like, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is not to do with emotions. It doesn't say, you know, if, if the day's going good, if you guys are having a good streak, if everything's going right, Love your wife. No, love your wife regardless of how you're feeling, regardless of circumstances, regardless of how well she's loving you back. Love your wife. Jesus didn't love the church just because he knew the church was going to love him back perfectly in the last 2,000 years. Because guess what? Newsflash, it didn't do a good job at it. The church royally messed up so many times, I can't even count. And will continue to do so. And yet Jesus loved unconditionally. And that's the gospel, right? Like here we have the story of Jesus coming and dying on the cross for us and our sins and calling us through faith to love him back, to follow him. That's the perfect picture of what we as husbands should be like. We are called to love our wives unconditionally to love us Jesus, to go above and beyond when we're tired and when we come home from work. Let us continue to love and serve our spouses through acts of service, through giving of gifts, through quality time, through words of affirmation. There are so many different ways we can show our love. Jesus' love is known by sacrifice, though, right? It's this idea of agape, a sacrificial type of a love that's unconditional. And it's a love that's initiated, again, God could have sat back in heaven and just watched the world unfold and all of its sin and mess-ups and watch all the countries go down in flames. But he didn't. He took the initiative. And so as guys, my challenge is to take the initiative in your marriage to give up things and time for your spouse to serve actively in your love. And by doing so, you will fulfill the command of Christ to love your wife doesn't stop at that, though. I think it's actually a very similar verse in verse 28. It says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I think the scripture has an accurate view of a man's psyche because God knows that we love ourselves. I used to question this and say, do we really, though? Even when people commit suicide, unfortunately, it's done for ourselves. We do so many things, and when we ultimately think about why we do them, we do them for ourselves. And the scripture is saying the same way you love yourself, love your spouse. It's a strong call. We've all heard of the love passage. We hear it. It's one of the most famous scriptures besides John 3.16. 
And we and, and as you think about it, though, I think we automatically easily apply it to ourselves. So when the passage in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says, love is patient and kind, we automatically easily apply that to ourselves without even thinking about it. We're always kind to ourselves and patient. Whenever we mess up at work or at home, we're patient with ourselves. And God is calling us to apply that to our spouse, to be patient toward your spouse just like you are patient towards yourself, to be kind toward your spouse just like you are kind to yourself. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It's so easy to be arrogant and rude towards others, to envy at what other people have, or even to boast to make yourself seem better. And yet God is calling us to treat others in a way that's not like that, to be different. Because honestly, that's the natural way. I'm, every single day, I'm so close to doing all this all the time because that's me naturally. And yet God is calling me to live a supernatural type of a life, a life that's different. And only he can give us the power to live that way. It says, it does not insist in its own way, is not irritable or resentful. I don't know about you guys, but so easy for me to get irritable and resentful. The littlest things can tick me off. And while I may seem like I'm fine on the outside because pastors are great at putting on a mask, on the inside I can grow resentful. On the inside I can be irritable and maybe let a word slip every now and then. But God cares about our heart. As Christians, we are to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with everything as a holistic being, we are to serve and love God. And God is calling us, even in our heart of hearts, that we don't always show to people, to love him and to love others and to love our spouse. It says, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in with the truth. When you do great at work, you rejoice, right? When you mess up at work, kind of get irritated and yet God's telling you be the same way with your spouse when you guys see each other rejoice with each other when they do something well and when they mess up don't get irritable at them don't get mad or resentful but bear with them I love how this passage ends love bears all things believes all things hopes all things endures all things love never ends you know this is something we do to ourselves, again, automatically. We believe in ourselves. We believe that we can do our work well. That we can be a good parent. That we can be good at our job, good at our house, good at the things we do in this life. We hope for ourselves and for our future many times. We endure lots of different things. And yet God is calling us to do the same to our spouse. To do the same to those are around us. As Christians, we are to bear all the junk that's going around us, all the different things that our spouse goes through, that our spouse gives to us, whether negatively or not. We are to believe in all things. Now, that's crazy because the problem, with, like the thing with marriage is that we never stay the same. We're changing as individuals. So who you married will not be who you will be married to in five or ten years. We're constantly changing. And you have to believe in your spouse and hope for them. No matter what goes on, never give up hope for your spouse that they may change, that, that they may overcome. Continue always hoping for your spouse and endure. Whatever is going on in your life and in your marriage, endure all things. God is calling us to one of the highest commands in Scripture. I don't know about you guys, but I just flat out can't endure everything. I have a pretty good mm, 5 to 10 percent limit where I can endure things. I, can, I feel like I have a pretty high tolerance of endurance of all the junk that's going on in the world and around me and with coworkers. But there comes a level where I just kind of hit the ceiling and I'm done. I need to check out. Give me a book. Give me some solitude so I don't have to. Or a TV show where I can just shut off life and not think about it, right? 
I think we all have a certain point where we hit the ceiling, we're just done. We don't want to endure it. Why then does God call us who endure all things? It doesn't say endure some things. Endure all things. It's not possible, honestly, as humans. I believe it's only possible through the power of God. When God says at the end of that passage, love never ends, he's calling us to a supernatural type of a love. You see, this is where Christianity is different than all other religions. We believe that the universe was created out of love, not out of chaos, not out of other gods warring with each other. But we believe that the Trinity and mystery before time began created the world, not because they had a hole in their heart and they needed us, but because out of love they desired to create us to glorify God. And God, out of his sheer love, desires us to join him in love for all of eternity. And he knows that in this life there will be persecution, there will be things to endure there will be issues and problems, and yet God calls us to endure all things by joining him and his love. And we see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus gives us new life. Jesus is the only source of spiritual life. He is the only way. There is no other way to the Father but through Jesus. But Jesus is also the way. He shows us how to live. He shows us how to love. He shows us that love is active, that you have to take the initiative, that love is submissive, that love is sacrificial, that love is unconditional. And he calls us to imitate him in this love, a love that never ends. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for Ephesians chapter 5. And what it calls us to, it's, it's a big command. It's a big calling. And yet I believe that you call all of us to follow you and imitate you in this way. Give us strength to do that this week as we go our way. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, you are dismissed.